morning, Grace Chapel. If you please begin by turning with me to Philippians chapter 2. And again, as Steve said, we're very excited. Um, after a number of years, next week we'll be launching youth group again. And so we have not had youth group since before I got here, and I'm super excited about this because uh, if you didn't know, before coming here, that's what I did, is I ran a youth group for five years. And so we're really excited about that. And we are super privileged here. Uh, one thing that we did not have uh, in my former place of ministry was help. And as Steve kind of alluded to already, we are blessed with wonderful help in this church. Amen. If you've been here for any events whatsoever, uh, people, I'm amazed at, like, we don't have the biggest church in the world. We don't have the smallest church in the world, but we don't have the biggest church in the world. And the caliber of events that we're able to pull off, because we have so many people that are bought in, I think is really incredible. Venison dinner, youth rally, different things are fall fest. And uh, I'm very excited. As I said, when we did youth group and counter sport, it was basically my wife and I for the bulk of it. And we didn't have, like, any help. And that was really hard. And so here we're very blessed um, to have a number of wonderful people. I want to let you know Chris and Kim Carpenter, uh, Kevin and Kylie, and then my wife and I last maybe phasing out are going to be heading this up. And so I'm super excited about this, that we have wonderful people to work alongside uh, that are going to be leading this as a group. And so if you have young people uh, that are 7th to 12th grade, if you have questions, whatever, please be in touch. But we are super excited to get that started next week and to be able to see young people impacted for the sake of the gospel. So if you begin uh, by looking with me here briefly at Philippians chapter 2, I want to be begin by reading uh, the portion of scripture and then opening with prayer. Uh, we're going to be going through verse 12 and verse 13 this morning. The Apostle Paul writes and says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let's pray this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather uh, publicly as your people here to open your word and to hear you speak to us. Lord, I do pray that you'd speak to us through your word this morning. And uh, Lord, as we see some of the implications of the new covenant and the wonderful blessings that we enjoy as believers today. I pray that we would um, take these truths and Lord, that you would stir our hearts with them and Lord, that we would apply ourselves to diligence in the Christian life and that by it, we would be those who live lives that are pleasing to you. I just pray your hand upon this time. You bless the preaching of your word. I pray you give us ears to hear and that you'd speak to our hearts this morning in Jesus name. Amen. So in recent years, I have found out, and I'm sure that other people know this to be true, when it comes to personal health, you don't really get anywhere without effort. In fact, being healthy is an uphill climb. If you want to just stay the same, I've learned that you don't just stay the same. There was a period of time in my life where I had started doing some more exercising and things and trying to lift weights, which I'm a runner and I hate lifting weights. It's the chore to me. Uh, some people like lifting weights. That's cool. And I found that I got frustrated because I never got stronger. But the one thing I found is that I also never got weaker. Even just staying the same requires effort. Getting stronger requires effort. And so truly a healthy life is an uphill battle. If you've ever been on a hill uh, in neutral, you know that gravity doesn't take you anywhere worth going. If you want to win an uphill battle, you've got to put some effort in. Right? They, you, another famous quote is, even a dead fish can float downstream. It takes a living and active and healthy fish to be able to swim against the current. And so in this life, uh, in every area, growth takes effort. Maintaining even takes a little bit of effort. The only thing that's easy is to just go downhill or to just kind of go and do nothing. And so if these things apply to being physically healthy, I think they also apply to us being spiritually healthy. 
For truly, if it takes some effort to be physically healthy, don't you think it would take some effort to be spiritually healthy as well? I believe this is one of the reasons we need this passage this morning, because the passage is going to challenge us regarding spiritual growth. Because just as is naturally, muscles that aren't used end up atrophying, uh, so it is spiritually. If you aren't diligent in your own Christian walk, uh, we end up growing weaker. And so if you're a Christian this morning, uh, whether or not you realize it, you have embarked on a lifelong journey of growth. There's the initial time you come into faith, but then beyond that, God desires to see us growing over time. And so we're going to see uh, this passage stir us regarding these things this morning, and I pray it's challenging and encouraging to you. But before we dive into the text, a quick recap. Uh, We're now eight parts deep in Philippians. And back in chapter 1, Paul had issued a singular command. And if you remember, I told you it's kind of like an umbrella command. It kind of overviews the entirety of all of his ethical teaching in Philippians. He said back in Philippians 1.27, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so this is a command that kind of encompasses the entire Christian life. The first kind of sub-idea was remaining true to the gospel. Then we saw in the last couple weeks about living with Christian humility, right? Putting others before ourselves, just as Jesus was willing to live humbly, who was willing to leave the glory of heaven behind to come down, take on the form of a slave, to humble himself to death, and ultimately humble himself even to death on a cross. And so if we have him as our example, then we can walk worthy by living humbly. Last week we saw that he has now been exalted as Lord, and as Christians we are on the winning side. And so in light of all these things, again, Paul said about remaining true to the gospel, he says about Christian humility. Now we're going to see another idea backing up what it means to walk worthy as believers. So we're going to see him jump back into ethical teaching. If you look with me again at verse 12. Apostle Paul writes and says this. says, Therefore... My beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. At the outset, anytime you're reading the Bible, I'm sure you've heard this before. If you ever bump into the word therefore, you should ask what it's there for. You've probably heard that before. So Paul is continuing on with the same thing, right? Nobody begins an argument with the word therefore. They conclude their argument with therefore. So he's admonished us to walk worthy, to to stay true to the gospel, to be humble, following in Christ's example. And then in light of all of this, he pushes for further Christian obedience. Now, at first, we have to remember, originally he's writing this to a group of believers that happened to live in the Roman colony of Philippi 2,000 years ago. And so on the the basis of his first commands, he now kind of appeals to what they have been doing thus far. He's like, look, you guys have already been obeying when I'm there, so keep it up now that I'm not there, to the original audience. If you think about it, it's a lot easier to do the right thing when somebody's watching, isn't it? Yeah, (laughs) thanks. Which means it's a little bit harder to do the right thing when no one's watching, isn't it? Anytime my daughter's getting into trouble, she hides under the table, right? When she's getting into a snack she's not supposed to have, she doesn't sit at the table and say, Hey, Dad, I busted into the pantry, and I'm having something you told me not to have. They don't do it out in the open. What do they do? They hide, right? You just catch them on the table. And so you know anytime you find a kid under the table, they're up to no good. This is kind of what Paul's going for. He says, look, you guys have obeyed when I was there. He's the apostle. He's the one that started their church. So surely when the guy that started the church is present, they're going to live pretty good. Paul's reminding them, look, I'm not there now. Uh, You started off really good, so continue good. He says, even more in my absence, continue to obey, continue to live out this life. Remember, Paul's in jail, and they know this. So Paul's not going to be sneaking up on them anytime soon. He's not going to just be popping in for a quick visit. Hey, guys in Philippi, how you doing? Are you, you sticking true to the gospel and everything? They know he's not going to be showing up. So Paul says, listen, you've done good so far. You've obeyed in my presence. Continue in my absence. 
So he appeals to what his argument so far with the word therefore, he appeals to their previous obedience and he issues this command saying they ought to work out their salvation, their own salvation with fear and trembling. What in the world does that mean? To work out your salvation. If you've looked at the rest of the New Testament and especially the letters of Paul, uh, you know that he's pretty clear on salvation being by grace. It's pretty clear, but we're going to go through that this morning just to make this abundantly clear. Uh, In another place, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. We're not saved by our own good works. We're not saved by what we bring to the table. We're saved by a free gift of God's grace that's received through faith. In another place, in Galatians 2, verse 21, The Apostle Paul said, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. It's one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. Paul says, if you could be righteous by your own good deeds, why would Jesus die? It's a really good question, isn't it? If you could could find a way to live a God-pleasing life, If you could attain to the level of righteousness that God desires for you, if you could live enough good works and do all of the things, and you could be righteous in God's sight through the law, the Old Testament law, why would Jesus have had to die? The reason that Jesus came down and died is because we couldn't. No one was righteous. No one was able to achieve to that standard under the Old Testament. So Jesus came down to make up the difference. He came down to die on behalf of our sins. Paul says, if righteousness were through the law, Christ would die for no purpose. In Galatians 3, the Apostle Paul writes and says, So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. In Romans 3.28, he said, We hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And even later in the book of Philippians, in Philippians 3, 9, he'll go on to say about trying to aim for the righteousness uh, that is not through the law, but that's through faith in Christ. So if you look at the rest of the New Testament, Paul makes it incredibly clear, and I hope everybody hears me this morning, that your security in the sight of God, your salvation, your justification, all these things are a free gift of God's grace that does not come as a result of works. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't come to church enough that you'll go to heaven. You can't be righteous enough to go to heaven. You couldn't. That's why Jesus had to come down and die. That's the the basis of the gospel. So what does it mean then to work out our own salvation? One uh, Greek dictionary says that the verb signifies working at and finally accomplishing a task. It's a sense of striving after something. And so how does this work? Well, there's a couple theological terms I want to share with you this morning. You've probably heard them before. Uh, Two being justification and sanctification. The scripture makes it clear that when you come to faith in Christ... When you are saved, when you're brought into the kingdom, you are what is known as justified. Justification is a kind of legal term. It's almost a court term. It's where God pronounces you not guilty. Can you imagine the scene? Right? A courtroom scene. And you have somebody that, according to all records, is totally toast. Like they are guilty through and through. They're caught red-handed. That's you and me. Absolutely 110% deserve to be guilty. And the judge comes down and says, somebody else is taking the sentence on your behalf. I pronounce you not guilty. That is incredible. Something we totally don't, don't deserve because by nature we are guilty. That's who we are. And yet he looks at us and says, based on the sacrifice of my son, you are not guilty. You're justified. And see, what's amazing about this is that's an instantaneous thing. You are declared righteous in God's sight. But if you are like me, we are not suddenly perfect people, are we? 
wouldn't it be so much, I'm, I'm not going to tell God he does things wrong, but wouldn't that be so much easier? God says, boom, you're not guilty. And now you're flawless. You are just a perfect human being who never makes mistakes ever. It would just make everything better. Church people would never bicker, never be mean to each other. Everybody would always be a perfect witness in the community because we would all be perfect all the time. It would just be great. Just totally not realistic at all. <laughs> not a single one of us can say, well, ever since I was justified, I have never sinned. I don't know if any of us could say, since the day I've been justified, I've gone a day without falling short somewhere. We're not immediately like Jesus in our words and deeds, even though we would like to be. That's not how God has made this work, even though we're seen that way. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that for our sake, he that is God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so that's the beauty of the gospel is that we are justified. We are put forth as holy and righteous. We have the righteousness of Christ given to us by a free gift of grace received through faith. We're pronounced not guilty, even though by nature we were totally guilty. Justification is an instantaneous, once and done thing. But then there's also this term called sanctification. And sanctification speaks of when people are set apart as holy. And there's a sense that this happens instantaneously. There's this sense that God labels us as holy, even though we still all have our own messes. Right? That's why the word saints is found describing the Christians in the New Testament. Paul begins Philippians, and he writes to the saints in Christ Jesus who happen to be located in the Roman colony of Philippi. That word saints literally means God's holy ones, the holy people. If you are a Christian here today, you are a saint. And that doesn't mean that you're some part of some celebrity club. That means that God has labeled you as part of his people. He said, you are holy, you're set apart, you're distinct from the rest of the world, you're mine. That's what that means. And so there's this sense that that's instantaneous too. But there's also a second sense where not only are you sanctified as a past tense completed thing, but there's also this sense in the New Testament that we are being sanctified, that we are all a work in progress. And so that's what we're seeing in the text this morning. You can describe it as working out your salvation that God has already worked in. Uh, some scholars like to use the language becoming what you already are. Because again, all of us can look at our lives and say, well, God says I'm righteous. I'm set apart as holy because I'm in Christ. Again, it's all because we're in Christ. But I know me. I still deal with issues. I'm still a work in progress. We know this. And so the goal is in the Christian life to become what we already are positionally. God declares us righteous even though we're unrighteous because we're forgiven. But then to be able to grow in that righteousness, in that holiness, so that we can reflect to the lost and dying world that we belong to God. That's the journey of the Christian life. That's what this text is talking about this morning. One scholar has described it in these terms. It says that Paul was talking about continuing to work toward the conclusion of something already begun. So salvation is the end of the story. We know on the day of judgment we'll be pronounced not guilty. And we thank God for this. But in pursuit of that, in continuing that, that work in our present day lives, we seek to work out what God's worked in. And this command is a present tense thing. It's not something that's once and done. It's supposed to characterize our lives again and again and again. So I want to ask you this morning, church, how much effort do you put into your own growth in godliness, and your own progress of sanctification. See, because as human beings, we put a lot of effort into a variety of things. We are intentional in a lot of areas. People work on their career. People work on their retirement plan and their investments. People work on their physical fitness. People work on their fantasy football teams. I have, I've heard. I've never had one. People work on hunting plots, your business, relationships. We work on so many things diligently and with intentionality. But how often are we intentional to grow in godliness? We work on so many areas. We're so intentional in so many areas of life. But for some reason, this is something that oftentimes slips through the cracks. Coming to church regularly is a great start. But beyond that, are you diligent at all to work on your own godliness? 
And Paul further qualifies this and says that you should work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Right? There's a sense that we live this life before God, who is our creator. He is the one that made us. He is the one that gets a claim on how we ought to live. Right? He's the one that can look down and say, this is how you ought to live as human beings. This is what I've made you for. And not only is God the creator, can I tell you this morning, God is a holy God. And God being holy means that he's never done anything wrong. Isn't that incredible to think about? God is a holy God, and if he was imperfect, if he had sinned, if God had ever made a mistake, can I tell you he wouldn't be holy? But he hasn't. God has never made a mistake. He's never sinned. He's never had to say that he did something wrong because he is holy and he is perfect. And you know what's really amazing about that? Last time I checked, he's been around a little bit longer than we have. Every single one of us, the longer we live, the more likely, the more time we have to mess things up, right? Abigail hasn't had a whole lot of time to mess stuff up yet. As you get older and older, every day we have opportunities to mess up. And God has been here from eternity past. In the beginning, God, he was already there. Before the beginning, at a beginning, God was there. Do you know that? And he's got a perfect track record of doing the right thing 100% of the time. And we as human beings are tasked with living life in his presence, living life before this creator who is holy and perfect in all of his ways. And so Paul says fear and trembling. It is kind of a fearful thing to know that God sees everything that we do. At least it should be to some extent. It should cause you to, to think about the life you're living. So Paul says to work it out. He says to work it out with fear and and trembling. One commentator has said that it's a recognition that in God's presence, no effort could be too great. Knowing that everything we do in this life is on display before God. But in the midst of this hard challenge, in the midst of this stuff that's really serious business, Paul shares something this morning that should greatly encourage us. Let's look at verse 13. He says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So Paul began this, this morning's text with this command. So to work out your own salvation. You should be growing to become more of what you already are positionally. You're positionally holy. Now you should grow to actually be holy so people can see it. And if you're like me, you might look at this and say, well, how in the world can I be godly? I live with me. Do you live with you? <laughs> you realize that we make mistakes? You say, how can I get it right? How can I grow to live a life that's pleasing to God? I don't have what it takes. Good news is you don't have to have what it takes. Paul says there's someone that's at work in you. It's not just you trying by your own effort. It's not just you trying and trying and trying and trying, and maybe someday you might discipline yourself into it. Paul says there's somebody that's at work in you, and it's God. The same God that created the universe, he is at work in you if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. That's good news. And if you remember back to chapter 1, Paul said at one place in Philippians 1.6 that, that he who began a good work in you, he'll bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And so I want to tell you this morning, if you're in Jesus Christ, if you've been forgiven, if you are a Christian this morning, we have this assurance that God has begun a work in us. We have this assurance that God is going to complete the work that he began in us, and we should thank him for that. And we also have the assurance that along the entire journey, he's at work in us. He begins the work, he finishes the work, but he carries us through. He's at work in us the entire time. Paul said at the beginning of today's text, present tense, we ought to work out our own salvation. How? Why? How can we do this? Because God is, present tense, working in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So what do these things mean? The first one is to will. God works in us to will. This has a sense of wanting or desiring, but it's also got this sense of a resolve or purpose to do something. And so here's this amazing truth from God's word, is that God actually shapes our desires, our wants in this life, so that we want 
what is pleasing to him. Can I encourage you this morning? The Christian life is never meant to be a life of doing things that you hate in obedience to God. It's not like, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to pray. I don't love people. I hate all of this stuff and God expects me to do all of it. Can I tell you, God shapes our desires. And see, this is the wonderful thing is it's not just a legalistic thing. We don't just do the right thing because it's the right thing. You can do the right thing because your heart has been changed to love to do the right thing. And so this is one of the good news. One aspect of the good news is that God not only forgives us as a gift of grace, but then he works in us and continues to shape us by his grace. Doesn't mean the Christian life's always going to be easy. It doesn't mean you might never, you'll never face temptation and never want to do something that's wrong. But by and large, the Christian life is one where you don't obey God with gritted teeth. You can obey God with a smile. Why? Because he's shaping your heart. See, this is one of the wonderful truths of the new covenant. There was this prophecy that came in, under the old covenant, under the prophet Ezekiel from chapter 36. And he says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Can I tell you that is the new covenant that we enjoy today? Every single one of you who is a believer today, you should thank God you get to be a part of the new covenant. Amen? Amen. Where God gives us a new heart. God gives us his Holy Spirit. God shapes us into being the people that he wants us to be. And can I tell you this morning, it's really hard to break with your sin if you still love it. If you have sin in your life and you just absolutely love it, you know why it's hard to break with it? Because you still love it. And if there's times in your life when there's things you ought to do that you don't want to do, but you ought to do them and you don't do them because you don't want to do them, you know what you need? You need God to work on your heart so that you don't have to live life miserable because you hate doing the right thing, but you get to do the right thing and you love to do it. And not only that, that you don't face the same temptation for the sin that you have in your life. Suddenly you realize, hey, God hates this sin. I hate it too. And God shapes your desires by giving you that new heart, by working within you. And again, the good news is that the one that is at work in us to do this is God. That God is at work in us, giving us the desire to do what's pleasing to him. This should be one source of assurance that you have in life, that your life, if you desire to please God in this life, that's not something a non-believer has a desire for. If you've got a desire to, to obey God and a desire to do what's pleasing to him, it should be a source of assurance for you. So the first thing that we see is that God gives us to will of his good pleasure. The second thing is that he gives us the ability to work. And this is one of the things that I love about God. He gives us everything we need. He gives us the new desires and he gives you the ability to work it out. Can I tell you the Christian life is not one where you're chasing a carrot at the end of the treadmill? It's not like you're going to try to grow and you're going to try to go, you're going to try to grow and, and growing in any sort of practical righteousness or holiness is that carrot you can never attain. I tell you, I, I am a runner and I hate treadmills more than anything. I will run in the snow before I will run on a treadmill. That's why they call them the dreadmill. And the thought of trying to reach the end, it's the most unappealing thing in the world. I would rather go outside and go on a journey. I'd rather actually go somewhere. Do you know that's what God gives to us? You're not just striving after something you'll never get. You're not reaching after a carrot. God not only gives you the desires, but he gives you the capacity to live it out because he's put his spirit within us. And so God is at work causing all these things. He is at work giving us to will, to this new desire to please him. 
And he is at work in us not only to will, but to do, to, get, to work out his good pleasure. And the wonderful thing about this, I want to tell you this morning, that this is one of the greatest solutions to pride. I don't know if there's anyone here this morning that deals with pride. But can I tell you, if you believe this text this morning, if you believe that Philippians 2.13 is actually God's word, that none of us have any reason to be proud at all, you know why? Anything good that is in us, do you see where it comes from? It doesn't come from me. It comes from him. Why do I have the desire to please God? Because God put it there. How do I have the ability to live out that life that is pleasing to God? God put it there. See, church, anything good that is in me comes as a function of God's grace in my life. And so how could I boast? How could I boast about anything that God's done in my life except for boast in him? Right? I can't tell you about how great I am because I'm not great. Anything that's great in me is something that he brought about. And so I look back over my life. Can I tell you since I have come to faith that my vocabulary has changed? Anybody else here? There's a lot of things I used to say I don't say anymore. Am I the only one? I hope not. <laughs> look back over my life. There's things that I used to watch and enjoy. And guess what? When I came to faith in Christ, I don't watch and enjoy those anymore. Amen? I hope there's some people here today that can say that. Is there anybody else in here that can look back over your life and say, I am not the person that I used to be? Okay. You guys are really not excited about that. That's something worth rejoicing over, isn't it? You can look back over your life and you could probably all, everybody that's a believer, should be able to look back at who you used to be and say, thank God I'm not that person anymore. I might not be perfect today. I'm certainly not perfect. Steve told us this morning in class he's not perfect. So I got at least two that are saying today that we're not perfect. But we're not the people we used to be. And why? Because God is at work in us. So we can't boast in it. It's his grace that saved me. It's his grace that's changed me. It's his grace that's made me into a new person. I didn't, I didn't do anything. He gets all the credit. And so that's a wonderful thing we see in, in the text this morning. And so as we look at this passage, we ought to see this truth that as God's people, we ought to strive to work out that which God has already worked into us. Right? God begins the work, God's planning and promising to finish the work, and God is telling us that he is at work in us right now in the present. But I want to tell you this morning, this assurance that God is at work is only for those who have been saved and have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. It says that God began a good work in you, and you can have the assurance today that if God began a good work in you, he's going to finish it, but you need to first know that God's begun a work in you. And that work, again, is a work that begins by grace. A work that begins with him whereby he forgives us. Because all of those who are outside of Christ, we can't live a life pleasing to God if we're outside of Christ. Paul in another place in Romans 3 said this. He said, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God, all have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery in the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's life outside of Christ. It's hopeless. It's utterly hopeless. No one based on their own good works, as we saw earlier, can save themselves. No one based on their own righteousness can save themselves. If you could have saved yourself, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die. But the good news this morning is that even though we were utterly hopeless, even though we couldn't live a life that's pleasing to God, even though we were unrighteous, at the right time, God sent his son into the world who lived the perfect and sinless life that you and I should have lived, and then he died the death that you and I should have died. Scripture says that the wages of sin is death. You live a life in sin, your paycheck is death. 
But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're looking for a paycheck, you can live a life of sin and get death. But God doesn't give you a paycheck for your good works because they're not worth anything. Instead of giving us a paycheck for our works, God gives us free gift. It's not worked for. It's totally undeserved, and it's a gift of grace. I want to tell you this morning, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can be forgiven today. He came down. He made a way for you. And before we talk about growth and godliness, you need to first know Jesus Christ. We can't strive to live that life that's pleasing to God if we don't first have Christ in our life. That's where it begins. But for those of you here this morning that are believers, who are recipients of grace, who do have the hope of heaven in the future, I want to challenge you this morning, you should be striving to grow. Paul says this morning, work out your own salvation. You should be growing. You should be, what God has done on the inside of you should be showing up on the outside. The holy label that he's put on you as, as being his possession, people should be able to see evidence of that in your life. All of us should be diligent, should be striving to grow. Again, this is a command. So I want to ask you this morning, when was the last time you got on the scale spiritually and you looked at your own life? When was the last time you took a good, honest look in the mirror spiritually? When was the last time you went and got a checkup spiritually? We do so many things naturally. I said at the beginning, there are so many areas of our lives that we're diligent in. There's so many areas of our lives that we're intentional in. And a lot of times, if we're not careful, our faith can be something where we just kind of casually go through the motions. We're not intentional with it at all. Naturally, you can get an EKG, an ECG, every other G for your heart. You can have stress tests done. You can have blood work done. You can have all sorts of things to ensure your ticker is still ticking. But have you checked your heart this morning and how you live before God? Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. And so Paul gives us this command. He says we ought to work out our own salvation. We ought to strive with some intentionality by the grace of God to be more like Jesus tomorrow than we are today. That's the journey of the Christian life. Again, it's a progressive thing throughout your life. It doesn't just, it's not just once and done. You are justified once and done. You are seen as holy in God's sight. That's once and done. But he still wants us to actually grow so that other people can see it too. And becoming more like Jesus is a pretty lofty goal. We know that we'll never attain all the way there. Right? He's the sinless son of God. We're not going to be perfect this side of glory, but that doesn't mean that we can't grow. And so I want to challenge you this morning to honestly look at your life and find an area of your life that's out of step with what God wants. God, the scripture here this morning says that God wills in us. He gives us to will and he gives us to work of his good pleasure. It's the things that he wants. He gives us the, the desire and he gives us the power. He front loads it and then the command comes to us, work out your own salvation. It's like he gives you the recipe and he gives you all the ingredients and now you get to bake the cake. It's basically what's going on here. He's done all the prep work for us except for actually doing whatever it is. And as I said, I'm sure all of us have areas that are outside of what God desires, areas where maybe we're not living up to his good pleasure, areas where our life is not like Jesus's. I want to challenge you to find just simply one thing to work on. You'll notice in your bulletin this morning, you have a couch to godliness handout. Again, I'm a runner. And they got couch to 5K. They got, they got a couch to marathon, believe it or not. And so this morning, I want to challenge you with a little couch to godliness plan. For you to look over your own life, to try to find something in your life that you could practically grow on. I'm going to leave it general because everyone's life is different. But I want to challenge you to do something small and something intentional. Because what happens for a lot of people is if you just want to be like Jesus more... That's super vague, and all of us have got a long way to go. 
right? And so they say about setting small goals. They say about you, how do you eat the elephant? You eat the elephant one bite at a time. It's my favorite quote. And so when you talk about natural fitness, maybe instead of setting a goal of a marathon, you set a goal of a 5K. Maybe instead of, if you're looking at natural goals, maybe instead of aiming for 12-pack abs, you aim for a, a two-pack first. Maybe instead of, I want to lose 50 pounds, losing five or 10. Doing something small keeps people from getting discouraged. And when we look at Jesus' example, we look at our own life, it's a lot different than losing 50 pounds. We've got a long way to go. But you could still find something in your life to be diligent in, to apply yourself in. And again, pursuit of being like Jesus, it's a lifelong goal, but it should be pursued with intentionality. We work on so many other areas in life, and if we're not careful, we just kind of mosey on through. And so you could try to add good things. You could try to add more Bible habits in your life. Say, you know, I need to grow in my Bible reading. I need to grow in prayer. I maybe should start coming to church more or coming to midweek service or something like that. You can look at your life and say, maybe I don't want to add good things. Maybe I want to just take away bad things, different sinful habits that you have. Say, instead of complaining, I want to offer up thanksgiving. Personally, for me, I've looked at myself and I'm like, I'm a, I can be impatient with people. And so I'm going to remind myself, love is patient. If love is patient, then I need to be patient. And if Jesus could put up with disciples that just didn't get it for three and a half years, then this is an area I can grow in too. I just want to challenge all of us. He's given us everything we need. Again, he's given us the recipe. He's given us all the ingredients, but we just have to bake the cake. We have to do our part, be intentional, because he is at work in us, and we thank God today for his grace in all of this. Amen. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you uh, for the wonderful truths from your word. I thank you that when we could not attain to the righteous requirement of the law, when our good works were not sufficient, when our righteousness was not sufficient, that you sent your son into this world to pay the penalty for our sins, that we might be forgiven by a free gift of grace, that when we were utterly hopeless, you made a way for us to have hope. And Lord, I also thank you that you don't leave us on our own in this journey. You begin a good work in us. You promise to finish the good work in us. And likewise, you are at work in us in the present. You give us desires that are pleasing to you. You give us the power to do those new desires. I thank you for the wonderful hope of the new covenant. Uh, Lord, that you give us a new heart. You put a new spirit within us. You, call, you give us this ability to obey your statutes. And Lord, as we look over this command today where Paul says to work out your own salvation, to manifest on the outside a little bit more of what you've put on the inside, I just pray that we'd look over our lives, find an area that maybe we've been lacking in, find an area that maybe we could live a better life in or be a better example to others. And that by your grace and by the conviction of your spirit, we might be able to apply uh, the truths of your word to this area, to be those who shine a light before those around about us, uh, shine a light before a lost and dying world, and that by it we could bring you much glory with the lives that we lead. We thank you for carrying us through, and we thank you for your grace today. We pray you bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen.